Welcome to the Land Geek Podcast, your resource for information and tips to making money by buying and selling land. Let the Land Geek show you how to make a passive income by working smart, not working hard. Learn strategies and tricks to make money buying and selling raw land today. And here is the man that's going to help you do that, the Land Geek. Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek from your favorite land investing website, thelandgeek.com. And this morning, I'm very happy that he's in his <laughs> swimsuit. Duran Frazier from the land, is it landhub.com or thelandhub.com? It's land, well, actually, we own both domains, but it will be landhub.com in about a week here. So, okay, from landhub.com, which is easier to spell than ruralpropertyfinder.com and reserveland.com Duran Frazier sitting in his beach house with his skivvies on what's up now you know what can I can I ask you do me a big favor I would like you if you could just send me a real quick uh just do a real quick intro of me again just say Duran Frazier just introduce me Duran Frazier (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. That's, there I, you just, go. I didn't have that set up in time, so I wanted to make sure that <laughs> he's got he's got the clap going. <laughs> anyway, um, hey, everything's great, Mark. I uh, you know yesterday was a big day for me, and I think I mentioned it to you, but I bought a couple new surfboards, so it was a big day in the uh, in the realm of surfing for me. That's that's great. That's yes, great. I, and I know listeners probably could care less that I, I surf, but you know, I as as you get older. Um, you, you really tend to start looking at boards and like, it's kind of like what's, 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 it's like riding a bicycle. Like as you get older, the, the bigger the bicycle, the more bulky the bike, the easier it is to ride. Um, same thing with a surfboard as you get older, like the fatter the board, the more volume the board has, the easier it is to paddle in the surf. So nice. I, uh, yesterday I went and picked up a couple boards that had a lot of volume because I'm getting older and I mean, I tend to be getting a little bigger in my old age as well. Well, you know, what's interesting about that is I think everyone's interested in your, in your lifestyle. Because literally, you're working out of your house, you're drinking a cup of coffee, I can see you're in your swim shorts, you surf every day, you play basketball. How can I get to be from where I am, which might be working a 40-hour work week for somebody else, making them rich, to being a entrepreneur and being, you know, being in charge of the three W's, work when I want to work, where I want to work, with whom I want to work. How can I get from where I am now to being, to emulating you and your lifestyle? Um, you know, I, I guess that, there's two, the two kind part. of words that I like. Yeah, I, I, there's two words that I would associate with what I do. Um, it's called research and it's called risk. Um, with research and risk, I'm able to do a lot. I can, uh, I, I, I will go and I will, I will, I will do my best no matter what I'm looking at, whether it's land or something else. I'm always trying to solve a problem and, it, and that happens through research. And then the next step is taking the risk. Um, and that's, I think, where a lot of people, people will research ideas and concepts and go, hey, how do I, how do I make money? How do I do this? How do I create a passive income? Well, it's always thinking creatively on how to, how to, you know, how to, and, and even on the research aspect, thinking, how do I research this creatively? How do I, how do I look? Cause I, you know, I'm actually writing a, a fairly extensive article for a magazine here in San Diego right now. And the article basically is, is tips on, you know, tips for an entrepreneur to, to sort of how to, how to take an idea to fruition. And, um, and, and in that, I, I sort of, I sort of dialogue, uh, what, you know, why we, why we take risks, why we don't take risks, why being complacent is, well, is wait, not- wait, wait, let me stop you there. Why don't we take risks? Like I, I honestly, I think I'm risk averse because when I buy, when I feel like I buy a property 20, 30 cents on the dollar, there's no risk there. I'm making money on that buy. I know definitively I'm going to make money on that property. There's no risk when we buy property that inexpensively. Correct. So, so I feel like there's not, I mean, I think the, the, the leap of faith is that you're buying it right when you first get started, right? Because well, you don't know. Spend, I mean, spending money. The leap of faith is not, not so much buying it. It's actually spending your money like taking taking a check or or wiring uh, you know wiring money uh, for something that you've never done before. So you're taking a leap. It doesn't matter whether you bought it for thirty. You know what? I bought tons of things when I first got in this game. I bought tons of things that I was buying for ten cents and five cents a dollar, and I still was nervous when I bought it. 
You know, Mark, we did a we did a multi million dollar transaction together, Mark. No, I, I know. I, I was very nervous about that. I, I you know, and, and you know, going going back to the story, and we've talked about it on a, on a on a previous podcast. I had two hundred and I think two hundred and sixty five or two hundred seventy five thousand dollars in the bank at twenty four. Okay, right. and of that money, I took two hundred and sixty. I had like ten grand left in the bank, and right. I put it all down on a massive transaction. A massive transaction, and for me at that age, I didn't care because I had, I literally was paying 200 bucks a month rent, living in Pacific Beach. I could do whatever I wanted at that point in time, so I knew I could, I could rebuild because it took me a year and a half to make that money anyway, or a year. So I knew, and again, market's different now, and I'm not going to say it's going to happen like that again. But there are deals like that. You just got to right. go find them. Well, I mean, I just bought that that 210 lot subdivision in Texas, and I bought it five, ten cents on the dollar from the developer in the POA that went under. Was I was I nervous? Absolutely. But I know I'm gonna make a ton of money on it. I'm still nervous for you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not that so nervous on that deal. But you, you know, but you know what you were twenty four when you did that. I was thirty, right? I had at that time one child. Yep. Now I have three. Yep. You had no children, you weren't married, you had no responsibilities. If you know, so we if we take that. Let's let's say the our listeners in their forties now, they've got a job, they've got responsibilities, they've got a mortgage, they've got car payments, they've got insurance. You know, they don't they don't have low overhead. So for somebody like that to go in and say, Huge. okay, I'm going to put money down, and I'm going to start this new venture, their their level of risk, their perceived level of risk goes way up, doesn't it? Hundred percent. That's actually one of the things I address in this article because as we get older, it's a lot harder to take those risks. Obviously, because we add priorities to our list. You know, whether it's just spouse, husband, or wife, children. Those those responsibilities make it a lot more difficult to take risks. But if it's if it's calculated risk, and that's where you need to understand what the difference is. If you if we, when we're talking about buying a property, if you understand and you're researching the sales aspect of it prior to the purchase aspect and knowing what these properties are selling for, the risk. You can mitigate all of it by going, okay, well, I can buy it for 20 cents a dollar. I know, I've seen, I've tracked that 30 of these properties sold for this amount or close to this amount. I know what it's going to sell for. I'm comfortable. I'm fine. Right. And so that's where you sort of go. So you've got to look at the front end. You've got to sort of sort of forward forward think it and then come back and step back and sort of you know analyze that risk. Right. And you know, you know the funny thing about it is, and the reason I don't think there's real inherent risk is that at the end of the day, you own an asset. You own land. Correct. Correct. Right? It's not like, I mean, I know I know guys that they get into a business and they buy up all this inventory. They can't sell it. It's worthless. Yep. yep. You know, there's, there's nothing they can do. It, it becomes obsolete. It can break. There's no market for it. You know, we know we've done our total market analysis. There's a huge market for land. Huge. It's massive. So it's not like you're going to be stuck with with an, with an asset that you literally can't sell. There's a market for it. Now, However, now, if you don't want to sell it or you don't want to have the wherewithal to sell it, you don't need to. You've got a nice asset that you can hold and, and do what you want with it. I mean, keep it for your kids. Yep. Yep, I agree. I don't think and, there's much risk. No, I, I mean, I agree. And we're, we're talking about... You know, again, folks, we're not talking about land that costs one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. We're talking about land that you can go pick up for a hundred to a thousand dollars an acre that has value, um, right. and that and that land is out there. I mean, we're not we're not. If you're talking about you know paying you know you know fifty grand for ten acres, we're, that's not the business we're discussing here because that's a risky play. Um, now, when I say that's a risky play, that that's saying that's saying that 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 you you've got. You, that you've got some sort of comparable to 10 other properties that sold. I mean, if, if that property sold for 150 grand and you've got some comparables and it can sell for a hundred, hundred thousand dollar profit, that's a different story. But we're talking about property that you pay for, you know, you know, anywhere from, you know, 500 bucks to, you know, 5,000, 10,000 that you can turn or you can hold or flip. So you can hold on to that asset and it's not going to, you know, break the bank. Right. Right. And the way I like to do research is I'll literally put up an ad in Craigslist or eBay before I even own the property and see what it sells for. And I'll, I'll do a whole bunch of different price points. And then I know, okay, this is the market for the land. This is what I need to buy it for. So 
I, the, I would let the market tell me what they're going to pay for that property before I go out and buy it, right? Yep. I mean, yep. You, do you, you do the same thing? No, I don't. You don't do it. You just do your research and then you, you buy it. Yeah, Mark, you do a lot of things that are unethical to me. How, so, is, that, how is that unethical? I mean, that's, it's false taking, advertising. Wait, 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 no, wait, how is it unethical? I'm not taking anybody's money. I'm not selling it. I'm just advertising it. But you made somebody so it. excited. You made someone so excited that they were going to be able to buy that piece of land for so cheap. And then you go, oh, sorry, I'm all out. I mean, what do you say to the poor guy? I'll say, I, I pre-sell it. I said I'm going to get it in 30 days. <laughs> I'll close it in 30 days, which I will. Pre-sold. That's yeah. not unethical. That's that's uh, just being uh, smart. You're right. You're right. I. You're right. Okay, you're so smart. fine. Is it, is it unethical for for Apple to pre-sell the iPhone? No, but hey, I gotta I gotta tell you, Mark. You know, speaking of speaking of of ethical and unethical, yeah. um, there's a new company that just came. Out. I saw the video last night. If you haven't seen it, you gotta look it up. It's called Phone Box. P H O N E. I'm losing you. Oh, it's called Phone Phone Blocks. I've heard of Phone Blocks. Tell me about oh, it. Oh, unbelievable. Anyways, if you guys haven't seen it, this guy, um, he's a Dutch guy, really smart. He looks like he could be Zuckerberg's brother came up with a concept where it's basically a, a, a board, like a motherboard, and all these little blocks plug into the back of the board, and on the front of the board, your screen plugs into it, and you can replace every piece of that phone. So if you're a, if you're a um, photographer and you want a bigger lens, you can put a bigger lens on it. It's open source, so all these companies can come in. I mean, for, as an entrepreneur, I, I idolize this guy. I mean, this concept is unbelievable, but here's the problem. It, it solves a problem for all of us, but it doesn't solve a problem on the monetary side, which means Apple and Samsung will make sure this doesn't come out because they want you to throw your phones away and buy the new phone. So this thing is unbelievable and I pray it comes out, but I, I mean, you got the video. The video has got 15 million views in two weeks. It, it could literally change the industry if, if somehow this guy could release this thing, but we'll see. So it's called, it's PH, oh, like just look up phone blocks on, uh, on YouTube. P H O N E B L O K S and watch that video. I've, I've, heard, I've heard of it. Is it a Kickstarter project? I don't think so. I don't think it is. Okay. Um, I don't think it is because his problem is he's got to work with all the he's got to work with all these um, telecommunication companies, and I don't know if he's got that angle built in yet. Okay, I, I've definitely heard of it. So, all right. Anyway, I, I again, you guys know that we, my mind goes other places sometimes. Yeah, so we, we we digress. Let's get back to uh, to land the land business. Buying Cuts. land, selling land. All right, so tell me what, what deals are you working on right now? Um, let's see. I am working on a sale of a 640 acre parcel. Okay, how's that going? Um, very good. We're actually closing escrow in about six days. What platforms are you working? Um, what do you mean? Like oh, how'd, you, how'd you sell it? Where'd you go? That, that parcel was sold on Landwatch. Okay, beautiful. Yep, and that's a uh, that's a that's a fairly good sale for. For me, um, I, that was a long-term hold. Um, just so some of you, some of you guys are, uh, you guys may not be aware, but Mark and I bought a lot of land, and what we did is in, in, in 2002 or one to 2004, we subdivided a lot of land, um, and then and then a few years after that, they put a moratorium in place that Mark and I couldn't subdivide because we were going like gangbusters and selling this land, and I think the county was literally jealous of Mark and I making money. Yeah, the so, you know what it was? The county wasn't used to working this hard. And they're like, whoa, what's going on here? You know, you know what it was? It was a lot of fear too, because they saw how much we were selling and, yeah. they, and they thought, well, they were no growth county and they thought, well, we're going to have all these people coming here to live and we're not going to be able to provide them services. So they got scared And the reality of it was no, you know, people were buying it for a long-term investment. They weren't going out there to develop it. And, uh, did they did they ever lift that moratorium or is it still going on? Uh, moratorium is still there, and so so going back to the the uh, situation. So Mark and I, um, you know, go in there subdivide these parcels, and I don't know if it was fear on the county. I think I honestly think it was more of a um, sort of a posture move to control Mark and I from making money. Um, and they were a no growth county, but but there was a lot of politics involved. And Mark and I didn't play the role. Like we both lived, Mark lived in Arizona, I live in San Diego, and they knew who we were and we were helping the tax base. We we're doing a lot of things for the county, making them more money. And they had an excuse yeah. of, well, what about fire engines? They knew that most of these buyers weren't gonna go out there and build. And if they were, they were gonna be, you know, self-sustained, you know, doing their own thing, not worried about the, you know, calling up 911. So right. 
anyway, I mean, who, they know that they're, they're 20 minutes or 25 minutes away from, from, a, from you know, uh, an ambulance anyway. So it, it, the, that was the interesting part. It was, was that their excuse as to why we couldn't do this anymore. So going back to that, a year after Mark and I made a, a, big, a big acquisition of about 40,000 acres, um, I went back and made another acquisition um, on my own of another t- about 10,000 acres in Lander County. And I bought, I sort of bought this land thinking, okay, well, the, the area was, was booming. There was a lot of gold. Uh, there was a lot of growth from a, from a mining aspect, gold mines. And so I, my goal was to subdivide this, this now, stuff. Now, did you form that, did you do that lander acquisition with a syndicate? Did you form a syndicate on that deal or was that I, all you? No, I did. Part of it was a syndicate. So only part of it. Um, yes. Yeah, so I brought in a couple of family members on that project. Okay. Um, but, but I mean, that, I mean, syndicate, it was, like I said, more, more of a family, family project brought in a little bit of money they had in a couple, um, and a, they, they took us some self-directed IRA capital and stuck into this project. Okay. Um, so did that. And then the goal was to subdivide sell on terms right. and, uh, and then I would cover holding costs. Anyway, long story short is interest rate was high. I had a lot of holding costs every year. I mean, I was at, at one point between like 40 and 50,000 a year in holding costs, market crashed. But I'm like, I know this stuff has value, so I'm not letting it go. Like any smart man would be like, look, dude, we're out of this thing. We put down our 25% or 30%, but it's a couple hundred grand. Let's just let it be. Right. I, I said, no way. So yeah, see now, see if you know, on the on the other side of it, I would I would have actually tried to buy that land from you, knowing you were hurting and try to get the liquid, <laughs> try to get the liquidation value, knowing the market would come back in a few years. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But since we're friends, I didn't have that conversation but I, I i probably wouldn't have sold it to anybody anyway i mean i, I no, was, you, I, you were smart you you wrote you wrote it out but yeah i think most people at that point would have panicked yeah no i i agree and i i kind of i never really did panic i always felt like i i i had a i had a i had the ability to market in you know to market to several different channels and find a buyer if i needed to so it was never really a concern and i really was methodical about and my and analytical about the approach of how to sell it because i didn't want to give it away and i had to give a few away so there was a couple parts that I sold for 50 or 60 grand, which is close to what I paid for it. Right. Um, you know, hundred bucks an acre, whatever it was, which this stuff was actually really good. I mean, we, I ended up buying, I mean, the, the deal that I made with these guys was actually a really good deal and, and, and it was really good land, like a lot of roads, a lot of power, um, uh, and, and good roads. Um, I like, I have some properties that are like less than a mile away from a, from a mini mart and a gas station with power and roads. Um, I have a substation on one of the properties, which was great for alternative energy. So I had all these, and it was right in the Mecca of gold mining, which, which is why I have a mining project out in Crescent Valley, Nevada right now. So, right. It, so, but looking back on it, I, I, they, what they did is they, Lander County basically put a moratorium and said, you are not subdividing. Uh, and here's why. And the laws basically contradict each other from the state to the county. You had to have, the county said you had to have water, but the state said, we can't give you water until you subdivide. So it was really, you know, it was a catch 22. So I held on the land and, uh, and rode the wave. And, uh, and now from what, from what I've heard from agents out there, our land is extremely valuable. Um, right. I have a, I have a uh, 640 acre with power and roads that we think is worth right around 300 to 350,000. Right. right. Um, and we're in it, we're in it probably our cost basis is probably right around 70 grand. So that's a that's a good return. That's a pretty good return. <laughs> so it's a two hundred eighty thousand um, dollar profit. Yep, yep. Um, so and so we're looking. We're going to list that property in the next week or so because there are actually a couple of the mines are looking to build these mining camps, and so it would be a great sale for 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 me. And then I and then I and I, we paid off a lot of our debt as well. So we have we only have like a hundred grand in debt on about five or six thousand acres in that area, and of which four are tied up in the mining project, which have a nice, very healthy price tag on the property. So right. So let, me, so let me ask you: You make two hundred eighty thousand. Are you paying capital gains on that because you held it so long? Uh, long term capital gains, correct. Long term capital gains. So that's that's really not so bad. Okay. So so you basically separated out that deal from the typical flips, where correct. you might you might hold it for a month and then flip it. Correct. These are in a different uh, corporation. Actually, these are in, these are in an LLC. Um, and uh, and yes, I separated. Uh, some of these projects because I knew that that that, that these were going to be ones that were were either that were going to we were going to hold for a long period of time and right. so that's and that I was most likely not going to subdivide um, because when I moved them over at that point I'd already known that the county was not going to let us subdivide. Okay, yeah, so, see, I get a lot of questions about accounting and uh, dealer versus investor on these deals, so I just want to kind of clarify that. So. 
That's amazing. I mean, that's that's really inspiring that <laughs> you're making so much money on these uh, on these properties, and uh, it's you know if you're starting out, you're you're probably not going to buy a huge section of land, but you've got to start somewhere. I mean, Duran, you started with 800 bucks, right? 500. 500 bucks. And then you built it up to this point. Yeah. So you got to start somewhere. Um, I started with 3,000 and uh, and built it up from there. So it doesn't take that long as long as you're diligent with it and you work it. I mean, if you don't do anything, you don't make offers, you don't market, nothing's going to happen. So a lot of it is setting these activity goals up so that you can get to that point and then you're you're living like Duran. You're on the beach. Yeah. You're, and no, and and I'll be honest. You get to a certain point too. And, and in my life, uh, you know, at 25, and I think I, I've mentioned this before, but I had this. I lived the high life, right? Because I had the uh, financial ability to live the high life. I mean, I had I had the Range Rover. I had the, the you know I lived in the water in La Jolla. But I mean, everything was smart. Like I I would buy my cars at the auction. I would yeah. I would pay nothing for rent on the beach because I was the property manager. Like I always negotiated or created myself the ability to sort of live within my means. And so even now, like I live, I mean, you know, I, I pay nothing where I live. I, 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 I'm very, um, I'm very happy, happy and, and I'm humbled. Um, and I've been humbled many times uh, in, throughout my life. So I don't feel like, you know, make, this is just, to me, it's, a, it's a way to a means to, to have a life, uh, of a passivity or, or what's the word? Like just, just, uh, just, you know, like Being enjoy content? and yeah, exactly. And, you know, and, and, and it's not complacency, it's just content. Like I, I still go out and make things happen, but I'm, and I, I guess you could use the word. I'm a little complacent because I'm able to be so. Okay. That's great. That's great. Um, all right. Well, let's talk about, uh, customer relationship management. Uh, Mark, before you go there, you know, I, I don't get to ask you too many questions, but what, tell, tell me how, how, cause you, you were at a different point in your life. Right. Uh, when, when you when you made that financial commitment to get involved and to, to bring all the money in, to, you know, I, I started with 500. I know you had a little bit of money in the bank uh, or a little more money than I did. But you also had a lot of uh, you, 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 you had a lot of risks that you had to take that were different than mine. Why don't you tell the listeners about how you got to where you were, where it took you and, and how it sort of, you know, uh, you know, how, how you how you came to be, you know, where you are today. Right. So I was I was working as a business broker and I hated my job. I mean, literally hated my job. And I did it, you know, for five years. But in year three and a half, as I was really getting, you know, I wouldn't get like the Sunday blues. I would get the Friday night blues, anticipating that the weekend's going to go by so fast and I got to be back at work on Monday. I had a 45 minute commute to work back and forth downtown and you know there's corporate politics i had to kiss so much butt there's lack of control um there's ethical issues involved like you'd have to lie to try to get deals and it, it was just it was it was killing me and it was breaking my soul so i knew there i knew i had to change something i just didn't know how to do it i literally didn't know what would what would I what could I do? How would I do it? But um, I met this guy who was work, who just we just hired, and over uh, over a drink, he starts telling me how he's going to these tax sale auctions and buying up land, pennies on the dollar, and flipping it online. I'd never heard of such a thing. So I'm analyzing these companies, right? And a good company, a really solid company, had. Yeah. EBIT margins of, let's say, and EBIT is earnings before interest and taxes, free cash flow of 15%, right? A uh, average company, the average company looked at have a 10% EBIT margin, free cash flow. So this guy is making 300% on these flips all day long, 300%. So I said, look, you, you got to tell me more about this. So we went to a tax sale auction together in New Mexico and I'm freaking out. I take our last $3,000 in the bank. Uh, my wife thinks I'm nuts. I'm trying to convince her. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. And so I, you know, I go out there, I, I research the land, I drive around, I try to mitigate as much risk as possible. Right. 
I go to the auction. My heart's beating out of my chest, freaking out. My hands are sweaty. I, I think I bought 10 lots at an average price of maybe 300 bucks, right? Took it, boom. All of a sudden, I got $9,000 back in the bank. Boom goes dynamite. Boom. A month later, I flipped all of it, 300%. So now I've got 9000 So what I do with that 9000 I went to another auction, and this one was Arizona. On that auction, we were there. We were buying property for a dollar, three dollars, five dollars. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I made ninety thousand dollars at that auction. So from nine thousand to ninety, at that point, uh, I could say to my wife, "Look, we're almost there." And uh, that took about six, six to eight months to sell all that property, and. Uh, that was that was really it. And then 18 months later, I was able to quit my job. And uh, the land business really exceeded that income that I had at, at my uh, my job. So, you know, I worked it part time for 18 months before I was able to say or I was I was able to say, OK, I, I can do this full time. And, uh, you know, the family is not going to be consequenced because I'm, I'm making a you know, an impulsive decision just because I'm not happy at my job. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. So that, that's, that's really the, the story. Um, and, uh, and, and I've you been know, doing it for 12 years. Yeah. And you know, the listeners, just so you guys are all aware, we're not, we're not telling you guys that you're going to jump out of this and make a hundred grand your first year or 200 grand. The, the opportunity's there. Um, you got to right. put your head down and you've, you've got to quit your day job and focus if you're going to make that kind of money. The opportunity is no, definitely no, there. You don't, you don't have to quit your day job. No, if you're gonna if you're gonna go make two or three hundred grand in a year, you, it's got to be more than a than a. Although you can you can okay, you're right. Occasionally, you'll find the deals where you can make a lot of money. Um, I and I'm saying that we're talking about making a few hundred grand, you know, our first year and five hundred grand our second year, and I mean we were making a lot of money. Yeah, but Dran, if I knew then what I know now, I I would have been working that thing part time the entire time. I would have had systems in place where I, I wasn't doing so much of the work myself. But we sort of created that niche as well, Mark. So no, yeah, I know. I mean, we had to make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> and now, you know, now we can have other people benefit from our, our, our blood, sweat and tears trying to figure this out. But now that it's figured out, you're right. You I, know I what? I don't think you need to work it full time. You're, you're right. And you know, the other thing too is, and I don't do it full time. And I know Mark, I mean, Mark, Mark spends a lot of his time actually focusing on on um, helping people uh, right. solve the problem and and helping other people build their own business, so and he still does it himself. And and I and I do the same thing. I, I help people build their businesses, and I also do buy and sell land. So, um, but but in reality, th there there is there. I believe we're at a place now where in the next six months or a year or two years, that whole concept, like the equity market, to me is not sustainable. It's just not sustainable. Um, the, the real estate market, the prices right now, single family homes, to me, in demand, high demand areas, not sustainable. So at some point, people are going to go back to those cheaper assets. And land is still a great asset to hold. So eventually, those prices are going to change. And when they do, you're going to be in a great spot to go pick up land. And if, even if you have to hold it, we've talked about it before, if you hold it for six months or a year, let everybody sell their land they have in that area. If it was a tax auction, it's going to come back. And it could come back in full full effect. And it could be a pretty pretty uh, cool situation for everybody. Right, right. And if we had started the the note business earlier, man, that see that that was another big mistake we made. We should have started that from day one. Agreed. And uh, we'd be in such a better position as far <laughs> as how much we had actually had to work on it. Um, you know, because you you know you've got to constantly be hustling, bringing in deals, bringing in deals. If you're constantly flipping. But if you've got that note income coming in, it takes so much of the pressure off to constantly find deals, right? Yeah, yeah. And that was a big mistake we we didn't do from day one. Well, which... I, and let the listeners know we had we Mark and I had interest payments. I've, I I want to say a hundred to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars a year. Like right. we were like, we were writing checks for interest alone for forty, like like literally twenty twenty or twenty five thousand dollars a quarter. And so we we didn't have that ability because we had to focus on short term cash flow. Um, right, we, right. We we didn't have the ability. And had we had set, had we set it up and maybe restructured the loan, and problem was the interest rates that back then were what seven or eight percent. 
So we couldn't have really restructured our, our well, notes. And, and also the way we structured our note was, our, you know, when we did the takedown was that if, you, if we wanted to, as soon as we subdivided that property, we had to, as soon as we sold one property, we had to pay off the entire section. Yep. So 140 acre, we'd have to spend all this money to, to take that down because they wouldn't release it. Yeah. So we didn't really structure it and we, and we couldn't either. I mean, it wasn't like... It was either we had to kind of structure it this way or lose the deal. We did the deal, yeah. But that that did hurt cash flow in the beginning, as yeah. well. But you know we made millions of dollars on that deal. We did so. very, did very well. Um, Mark, why don't we get into um, our uh, our what is it? Our domain of the day or our pick oh yeah of the day? yeah. Let, let's talk about our tips of the week. I know tips I know we got to run. So why don't you go ahead and you can start first. All right. So I want to talk about customer relationship management but we got sidetracked. We can do that next week. Um, and Duran was hazing me before the podcast. He's like, man, that's so boring. It's, it, it's, it's a little dry, but it's important. It's important to be organized. Anyways, uh, we were on a uh, Platinum Mastermind call yesterday and Tori told us, he, Tori's a realtor in Utah, that he uses this incredible program. It's extremely inexpensive. It's cloud-based software. And it's realtyjuggler.com, R-E-A-L-T-Y, Realty, and then Juggler, like you're a juggler of balls, J-U-G-G-L-E-R.com. And it's incredible. You track your prospects, clients, uh, offers, promotions, closings. You can upload files, track documents, keep your parties, contingencies, other prospect details. Um send time release sequences of printed letters and emails, drip mails. You can use your own graphic letterheads for emails, letters, and reports. Uh, create activity plans, task plans, and it's inexpensive. It's 99 bucks a year. Um, I use right now a program called Daylight for the Mac as my customer relationship management uh, software. I, I'll tell you what, if I knew about this, I, I probably would have used this uh, over Daylight, but I'm comfortable with Daylight. And uh, it works great, but check out realtyjuggler.com. It might work really well for you. And the price is right. They've got a 90-day free trial. So for 90 days, try it out and see if you if it works for you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be here. Yeah. Don't forget to tip <laughs> your servers. All right. What's your what's your tip of the week? All right. Well, you know, we we there's there's a couple of really cool ideas and ideas that people like you and I, Mark, would probably never come up with but guys that are way more intelligent than we are would come up with. Right. Um, and you know, one of the things that I don't like to always do is, and even though I, can, I guess I talk too much and too fast, I know I do and people are like, what did you just say? Slow down, even my mom, every time I talk to her, slow down. And I'm like, sorry mom, I'm just, I got a lot on my mind, I wanna talk. Anyway, right. so one of the things I like to do is I like to, I like to leave messages for people because then I can kind of feel them out instead of calling them and, and having them pick up and have them listen to my fat, because then they can listen to me over like, like six, you know, they can replay the message six times and understand what I'm trying to say. Well, there's a, there's a great product called Slidial. S-L-Y-D-I-A-L. -L. What Slidial does is it allows you, it's an app, and it allows you to skip directly to uh, your, your voicemail, which, uh, again, we, we learned, Mark and I learned these yesterday in our, in our uh, mastermind session. Right. So, so uh, I'm not taking any credit for this. In fact, Wait, how, how much does this thing cost? Um, I don't know, to be honest with I'm, you. I'm on there right now. Oh, it's a, this is so slick. I don't know what it, what the cost is. This, this is a great way to save time, especially with the letter writing campaign. Yep. It's fantastic. I don't like talking to anybody. So there's a premium. I, there might be a free one, so which would be kind of cool. I don't know what the premium does, but of course, everyone's got a little upsell. They got to make money somehow when they create it this says, stuff. join my slide dial. Okay, join my slide dial premium. Pick a plan. So I don't know. I don't know where the plans are, but anyway, check us out. Kind of a cool idea, even if it costs a little money. To me, that kind of stuff is awesome because you go straight to voicemail. If you've got a sales team, if you've got whatever, if you've gotten phone numbers, and and the sales team is going to go lead, it's great because then the sales team goes, "Hey, I'm so and so. You've left the now you've left a voicemail. Um, you know, maybe you're on the do not call list, so maybe you get some problem, have some problems there. But but this just seems like a great way to to kind of get to you know to get those leads. Um, and, and really feel them out before you actually have a voice commitment to that phone call and go, you know, asking questions. Because if they don't want what you have, they're not going to call you back. Duran, this is a free program. 
You, nice. The, you can get premium, which will take out. They, this is an advertising model. So if you don't want the advertising, you can do. You can sign up for the premium. You can register two phones, and you can do a referral bonus. But if you don't want to pay, uh, then you can do it for free. And it's it's got uh, iPhone, BlackBerry, Android, and Windows Mobile app. This is really cool. Yeah. So thank you, uh, thank you on that uh, mastermind session. That was I think it was Jeff. Um, yeah. No. No. That was Tori. That was Tori as well. Gosh, yeah. Tori, we got thanks, Tori. We got to call Tori more often. I know. Uh, well, we're we're gonna do it again next week. Hey, listen, you know what? And if you want to get in on these calls, uh, contact me. You can sign up. So it's very uh, affordable. We'll talk about it. But it's if you really want to get serious with this business and want to know what the market's doing on a weekly basis, we have these weekly mastermind calls, and uh, the feedback's been tremendous. People who are in the uh, gold and platinum mastermind programs uh, are really happy. Yeah, you know, this is, what, this is what it sounds like when you guys go into our mastermind, this is what it sounds like. So it sounds, I mean, it's just a crowd of people that just yeah. are all in this big room together. Yeah, but you know, the whole <laughs> idea of the mastermind is that it's not just me. The room is smarter than any one individual. And uh, it's, it's great. So if you want to learn more, please go to www. Why do I even say www? Is it, is it, does everybody know it's www? Go to the landgeek.com, register, get for free the passive income blueprint. And uh, I'm also in, including in that now three fatal land buying mistakes program as well. Also, if you want to buy some wholesale land, go to frontierpropertiesusa.com. Get involved. Those Texas lots. If you tell me, you're a podcast listener. I'll give you a special deal. So podcast listeners are going to get a special deal. Also, Fiverr.com. Five bucks are the land flip. Only for podcast listeners. And please, give Duran some love. Go to LandHub.com. Go to ReserveLand.com. And uh, leave us a comment. Let us know how we're doing. Free Land Report, too. FreelandReport.com. Up and running, folks. FreelandReport.com. So... You know, uh, we appreciate you taking the time to listen. We'll be back for you next week. And uh, this is Mark Podolsky, the Lane Geek, with, in his skivvies, Duran Frazier, signing off. We'll see you next week. Thanks. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Land Geek. Join us next time for more tips, secrets, and information that will help you succeed. Stay connected with The Land Geek on Facebook at facebook.com slash thelandgeek.